everyone doesn't know. And we probably said this a hundred times, already, but we just want to you know, do a little refresher just to kind of remind ourselves like where we all started and really thank everyone for coming out to join us today. Um, this started off as like a local event. We didn't think that there would be this many people, honestly. Um, but I love that it's such an intimate gathering today and really bringing together local entrepreneurs and creatives and leaders in the Asian community to come together and celebrate all of our accomplishments. So Brian and I, we started Asian Muslim Network about two and a half years ago. So this was right before the pandemic. And we really wanted to create a community for Asian and Pacific Islander entrepreneurs, creatives, leaders, all of that. Uh, we didn't see a lot of representation in the Asian community. And we see this in many different industries, right? And so we were going to a lot of meetups, we were going to a lot of conferences, and we would always see a panel of speakers, but none of them were of Asian descent. And we wondered why, right? And when we think about the numbers, we I think there's like less than 2% of Asian founders that get venture capital funding. Um, when we think about Asian women founders, it's even like a worse percentage. And we have to think about like why don't we get the same opportunities as other people who are not of Asian descent, right? And so we created this community called Asian Muslim Network on Facebook. It started off as an online community. And in the last in the next two, three days, we've garnered to over a thousand members. So we thought, okay, maybe we have something here. And within two to three months, we had over 30,000 members. Now it's been over two years, and now we're at 200,000 members. So we can definitely see that there's a really great And this just goes to show just the need for an Asian community to come together and really have these events so that we could you know, see each other, meet each other in person, and just see what business opportunities, friendships, relationships that we can come together to create. Um, we had our conference in Las Vegas earlier this year to help kick off Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And I know that some people have gone to that conference as well. I see some familiar faces, so thank you so much for coming to that. But we wanted to create local events so that we could bring the event to you. And that's why we decided, okay, Seattle is such a diverse culture, diverse community, diverse city. And so Seattle is actually the first city that we're launching the AHN Talk Series to honor and feature Asian American and Pacific Islander creatives, entrepreneurs to share their stories. So as Brian mentioned, we have amazing speakers today, Nikki and Kevin, and then we also have Big Boy Johnny, who will be sharing, our stories, sharing their stories um, and really how they're shifting culture today. Um, and then, like Brian mentioned, thank you so much to our sponsors, Quinn from Vinasun, uh, Steve from AP, Yeah, let's get the show started with me and Kevin. Okay. Hello. Wow. I haven't done like an in-person talk in a while. It's all been like Zoom and the bottom half has been like pajamas, so. Right. No, same. This is my first in-person talk since pre-pandemic. So thank you so much for having us today. How's everyone feeling? Okay, that's not bad for Seattle. Pretty what do you mean? What do you mean for Seattle? <laughs> Thank you for braving the Mariners traffic and coming here. It means a lot to us. Yes, and parking. I know it was crazy. So thanks for being with us today. Yeah, so today we kind of want to share our journey, um, our journey in healthcare and in social media and talking about kind of how our Asian heritage really um, defined how we got to where we are today. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways we have really fulfilled our parents' expectations and in a lot of different ways we've defied our parents' um, expectations. So talking a little bit about how we kind of paved the path there. So you're probably wondering who the heck are these people? Why are they talking today? Um, my name is Mickey. I'm a registered nurse and a content creator. I graduated from UCLA back in 2018 and that's pretty close to when I actually also started to create content back in nursing school. Um, and we have Kev. Yeah, I'm usually just the guy in the background um, but we actually moved to Seattle because I'm a resident surgeon, so I'm doing my surgery training here. We've been here, this is our third year of being here in Seattle. We kind of came here uh, at by the start. Accident. By, by accident. By accident, <laughs> okay. But I, I made her move here with me um, for training. But um, basically I'm here doing my training and I'll be here for the next four years. So woo Seattle, we're, we're here for a long time. 
And uh, yeah, I have followers too on Instagram and TikTok. Please follow me. Um, let's try to get uh, let's try to get somewhere near her her numbers if we can. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so we do have a YouTube channel, um, a TikTok, and an Instagram. So we post weekly vlogs on our YouTube channel. A lot of these are day in the life videos um, detailing what it's like to be a healthcare worker during these fun times. Um, and then we also post short form content, which is really our bread and butter. So we usually make about three to five short form videos a week. All right, so I took this off the website, and Maggie already talked about this, so I'm not going to talk about it. But our goal today is to kind of talk about what it means to be successful and how does that change if you come from a person of if you're Asian like most of the yeah we have um, I guess I'm just gonna say this you know we have parents who are some they have different expectations of us and we have a culture that kind of expects different things from us and we kind of want to talk about that theme today and how that differs compared to mainstream media so Mickey what does it mean to be successful what is the equation for success? That is a really big question, but I think Kevin and I both come from family of immigrants. So we're both first generation immigrants. Um, and I think for our parents, they believe in this formula of success, right? You go to school, you get good grades, you get into college, you get a degree. Uh, if you get a degree, that means that you can get a job. And if you get a job, that means that you won't starve to death, right? And so a lot of this is around this idea of stability um, and having like knowing where your next meal is gonna come from, right? Yeah. And we both did that. We did. I think we both did a good job listening to our parents to well, try you to. Did. You're on that list, but yeah, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, I guess. All right. Can you go to the next slide? Yes, please. All right. This next slide, Kevin insisted yes. that we. I am include, a big fan so. of memes. This is my. These are my favorite memes. I don't know if memes are still a thing, but maybe from like 15, 10, 10, 15 years ago. This is. Uh, like a great expectation father, father memes. I pulled some of the, the best ones out here, but uh, I think we use memes to kind of show our anger and kind of frustration when things aren't, you know, exactly, exactly what we. we want. And, you know, being Asian, I think we had to face a little bit more difficulties or challenges when we we're kind of growing up. Next slide, please. And another meme, same, same meme, similar story. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting up here and you're like, why the heck is a doctor talking about this? You're literally checkmarking that first one. But I think I want to just talk about how, you know, being a doctor is, you know, there's difference between being a doctor and being an entrepreneur. And it's, it's not like, oh, being a doctor, you're a doctor. That's so cool. But being a doctor is actually pretty simple in terms of how you get there. You go to school, you go to more school, you take some tests. Actually, we can go to the next slide. There's a diagram, actually. Um, so you go to undergrad, you go take some tests, you go to med school, you take more tests, and then you take more tests, then you go to more school, and it's a linear path, like, you don't really have to, like, there's no, like, creativity or thinking that needs to happen, What right? Kevin is trying to say is that while it's very long and hard to become a doctor, um, there are very defined steps for what to do next. There's not really any question, right? But as an entrepreneur um, or trying to start your own venture, there's a lot of uncertainty and questions in what to do next. And, you know, having your parents and other people support you in those endeavors can be a little bit more challenging. Um, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And then even, like, within going into medical school, um, it's, it can be a pretty difficult task. Like, you, uh, this diagram shows that, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, I want to be a doctor. And then after, you know, some challenges, you decide it's not meant to be. And that's totally fine. And you know, there's a lot of barriers for Asian people to go and become a doctor because, or you have to get better test results. It's just unfortunate, but you know. Yeah, look just, at those numbers, yeah. you guys. So not only is there the model minority myth, right? So not only are we a mi minority, but we're also the model minority. We're having to live up to much higher expectations, um, not only in the way that we act and the way that we carry ourselves, but also quite literally in the numbers and the figures. Um, and then other than just having a glass ceiling, ladies, we also have the bamboo ceiling, which is just wonderful because we get, you know, kind of like a triple edged sword there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is not really talked about, you know, in, in our social media or in mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what a little bit of our motivation to be on, be in social media. Yeah. Yeah. 
So a little backstory on social media and how we got started. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Social media, we kind of stumbled upon as an accident. So I started back when I was in nursing school and initially my intent was to educate and to correct misinformation. There was a lot of um, you know, ideas that nurses basically just wipe butts all day and I wanted people to know um, a little bit more about what we actually did. And um, I also wanted the opportunity to educate. There are a lot of people who do not have access to healthcare or ready access to healthcare and to make sure that that information is more readily available. Um, you know, what better way to do that than through social media? So I made these really cute, you know, back when Instagram actually liked pictures, we made pictures and diagrams and really, really long captions. And that was captivating at the time. And if we can go to the next slide. I think I would describe social media for me, it's always been pretty slow and steady, right? It was never like anything crazy. Um, this is one of my favorite graphs of all time because it's called a plateau of latent potential. I think a lot of us have this idea that like, you know, your input and your output should be roughly the same. If I put in more work, then I should also receive more at the end of the day. And most of the times it's more so like an exponential curve. And what that means is that you'll see in this graph, there's something called a valley of disappointment where you think that you're getting much less than you should. And so most people quit before they even actually reach the latter part of this curve. And social media, I think it took me at least a year to hit my first 10,000 followers. I was responding to every single comment, every single DM, you know, commenting on other people's things. You know, one year for 10K, took me another year to get 100K, so 10 times that amount. And then within that year after, another million. So if I had quit at any point before that, I would have never been here, right? I'm really proud of Mickey. Um, not, for, not only for those accomplishments, but for using charts in her. Um, I Thanks. think that that's a, something that since we've been together that Mickey has more, moved more towards numbers. Yes, I have less brain cells than Kevin, so I need like a visual representation. But I think this is a really good uh, motivator for if people want to look at a chart. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the pandemic, like I said, we were always slow and steady. There was a lot of overnight sensations and um, I feel like especially in the AAPA community, like we don't really get that. Like we put in hella work and then we pray for just a little bit to come back. But the pandemic is when it really hit like an inflection point. Yeah, so like the virus is growing exponentially and then our, also our audience was growing exponentially. Um, but it was like a hard time for us and for me because um, I had moved here from the Bay Area to Seattle and then I started residency. So this is like my first job. I, I just finished medical school, didn't really have a graduation because it was over a Zoom. So I got, Mickey handed me the little hat thing. I and, hooded him. And then somehow I was a doctor and nothing really changed. And then I started, you know, writing prescriptions, seeing patients, COVID patients, every patient in the hospital. And it was kind of scary. Um, I was working like 80 hours a week. And at that time, you know, it was the Asian virus. We were uncertain what it was doing to us. And, you know, my parents and everybody were like, oh my God, was this being a doctor the right thing to do? Like, this is like literally. Like, Suddenly they were like, stay home. You yeah, shouldn't be a doctor. Yeah, it's, there's other things you can do. And I was also making like $15 an hour if you do the math. So there was some, I was like, hey, Mickey, you're making all this content. Maybe I should like document my, uh, you know, next like, week of work before I get COVID or something, right? Like document my last two weeks of life or something. No. Yeah, but basically I was really motivated. Like people should really see what doctors are doing and what we're doing. So that's kind of how I became more involved in the social media aspect. Yeah, and on my hand, um, on the social media aspect of things, we had always been creating educational content, but just nobody cared to watch or, you know, outside of the healthcare community. And when the pandemic hit, it gave healthcare workers a voice and a platform that we never had before. And so, you know, we started to make content relevant to current events. So washing your hands, you have to disinfect your groceries before you bring them in, um, you know, just live updates. And then on this next slide, you'll actually see that- More so graphs. Yeah, more graphs. I love numbers. Um, you can see that if you look at the pandemic dates, it actually correlates with when our subscribers, our followers, everything goes up exponentially. Um, and so I guess in a way you can say we capitalize on the pandemic. <laughs> All right, back to more, more memes, but kind of more, more thoughtful ways of thinking about how we're using our, you know, our platform and our reach for, for people. Um, 
you know, one of the things that comes about this, first of all, is, you know, you have people who you know who they're like, oh my God, you're, you're like on the internet. And like, especially my parents, um, they're like, oh wow, you have to be careful. Hey, you, well, you should make this content. Oh, you should do this. So um, getting them to kind of understand what it meant for us was a, you know, challenge, but they're yeah. turning around. They're like, oh my God, I have people who know who you are and I don't even know who you are anymore. Um, but the, the, the second part where there's people kind of reaching out to us, whether over DMs or seeing us walking down the street, and they're like, oh my God, I am so excited to see you. I, the reason I'm now in nursing school or medical school is because I saw you, I was motivated by seeing your videos, or even the other way around, they're like, oh my God, I saw your video on your shift. I was pre-med, but now I'm not. But we're still making the same impact. Like this guy could have gone to med school and be like, oh my God, this is terrible. I saved him probably good four to six years of his life. So there's different ways to make an impact like that. And this is why I think we need to make content um, that showcases this so people can see what it's like before they kind of drink the juice and be like, oh, doctor is so great or being in healthcare is great. So um, that's kind of a part of our motivation. Yeah, and I always tell people, I think people are like, oh, I'm not special. There's you know nothing that I do that other people don't. But we're literally just two regular people. Like whether you're passionate about plants, about keyboards, whatever it is that you're passionate about, there's a niche for it. If you're not on social media already, you know, hustling, I think it's there's space for everybody, even now. This is one of the first videos that I made uh, independently of this one. And it did get a lot of views. So, um, and I, I'm I'm very proud of the fact that I actually, you know, took a camera to work and tried to take all the videos of how I felt. And I guess I already talked about, you know, I think this this video, um, even some of my younger co-residents are like, oh yeah, I saw that video and I knew I, what I was ready for next year. So thank you. Um, speaking about social media more so on the business side of things, honestly, we would do it even if it didn't pay us a dime, but we are very thankful and lucky that it does um, pay a lot of the bills. We did just buy a house in Seattle. So thanks to social media for that. <laughs> um, I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs in this room, so I wanted to speak more on the money aspect and how we make money. Um, I think this is how most creators make their money, but the baseline is YouTube AdSense. So if you aren't familiar with YouTube, you basically get paid um, a certain amount of dollars per thousand views, and this depends on the niche that you're in, the amount of views that you're getting, whether or not people are clicking on that ad or if they're skipping on the ad, that all affects that number. Um, I have friends who make you know, $10 a month on AdSense, and I have friends who make six figures on AdSense, so this really varies. Number two, we have shorts funds, creator funds. This is TikTok or YouTube. Basically, when you make short form content based on the views and the watch time, you get paid a percentage of their fund from that month. Again, can range from a couple dollars to a couple thousands of dollars, so really varies. Um, the biggest chunk for creators, I would say, is brand sponsorships. For me, I would say make about 20% from everything else and 80% from sponsorships. Um, and so we've had the pleasure of working with some of our favorite brands like Fig Scrubs um, that we wear religiously, J. Crew, Google, Infinity, um, actually for AAPI Heritage Month, which is so cool. And finally, we have affiliate income. So if you ever see your favorite influencers, they're posting Amazon links, our style links, probably because um, they take a little cut of that with no um, extra cost to you. And finally, we've had some really, really cool opportunities. You know, again, we're just two normal people. So to have the opportunity to launch our own snack with YouTube, we made a cheesecake bar. Cheesecake is one of our favorite, well, I guess it's my favorite food. Um, and so we launched a cheesecake bar with a YouTube team and we had full creative control. We got to taste test them before we launched them. Um, and we passed them out at VidCon, which was so much fun. Uh, also got the chance to go to the Gold House Gala and speak to Henry Golding for a solid 30 minutes. Best 30 minutes of my life, of course. Uh, also met Michelle Yao, she was very nice. Simu Lu wasn't there, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Um, if, you look at, if you go back to that slide, you can see how all of those pictures was Mickey, but I would like to say I was involved in all of those pictures, just to make sure. I took that photo on that left, it was a lot of photo taking that day. On the right, I also took that photo. And in the middle, um, unfortunately, I was not the one taking that picture. 
but I was working that weekend and I was I was saving lives and I was on night shifts so I am contributing equally right so uh, kind of going back to the Asian equation I know we we talked about a lot of stuff but you know I think the two of us we tried you know we tried to you know we were getting our W what it were W2 jobs we have our we have our W2 jobs we're, we're doing all the things we can to you know support our ancestors and do all those things but we are we found ways in which you know that are non-traditional um, yeah. other ways to you know be an entrepreneur be ourselves and create you know like a brand and I think that's something that we want to share with everyone that we can you know create your own successes and celebrate victories in our own way yeah I think the biggest lesson I've learned is that you don't have to do what everyone else is doing right you can still work your day job or reduce your day job hours and still you know have the opportunity to let your creative juices flow I'm a, all about stability so I would never quit my day job because it's a consistent paycheck um, and so there's plenty of opportunities in the space even if you aren't quite ready to take the full leap and finally we want to close by saying you know we're so thankful and we're so grateful to just have friends all around the world we have four million friends so no matter where we go or what we do we're always running into so many of our subscribers and our supporters um, and it's been really great yeah it's been a good run Thank you, thank you. Hey, how's everybody feeling tonight? Give another round of applause for Kevin and Mickey, you guys. Um, I, I just want to take a quick moment again to just thank Brian and Maggie for just hosting this for us. Um, it's amazing, super humbling to be able to be here today and speak. Um, so give them a round of applause as well, too. Um, so for those of you guys that don't know me, my name is Johnny, also known as Big Boy Johnny. I am a YouTube personality. Um, on the Richie Lee channel where we talk about fashion and shoes and clothing and cheaper alternatives The best part about that is I get to do it with my best friends. Um, I also am a food truck owner um, I had one in the past called slide through I'm starting a new one called big boys burgers where we specialize in smash burgers And I also I'm partners with a clothing line called heavyweights with my best friend tan and um, Yeah, that's currently what I'm working on and that's what I'm doing um, when I was asked to speak for Asian Hustle Network, I was a little confused about what I would be speaking about. Um, so it made me think a little bit about what I would have in common with a lot of people here. And I would say one thing that came to mind on a regular basis was the lack of representation um, growing up. So I'd like to share with you guys a little bit about my upbringing and uh, how that allowed me to structure the way I look at business and um, how to carry it out successfully through finding the hidden truths of my adversity or uh, circumstances while I was growing up. So I was born in High Point, Seattle. Um, also, I was raised in White Center, Seattle. And for those of you that don't know, um, during the 90s, these areas were really bad. Uh, to give you an example of how bad things were, I experienced my first drive-by when I was five years old. Um, I wasn't shooting. I know you may have thought I may have been the shooter. I'm not. Um, but we, in, in these projects, we shared a very big backyard. So you live in these projects and everybody shares a backyard. So if you're drying clothes or playing with kids and stuff, um, there just happened to be people that didn't like my uncles and were targeting him, but they were actually aiming towards my area. And my uncle actually jumped in the way and took the bullet. So that was the first time I experienced like, um, asking myself if this is normal, right? Do other kids go through these type of circumstances when they're growing up or being raised? So fast forward um, to nine years old, uh, my parents split and they gave me a choice to live between either one of them or with my grandparents. Um, I automatically chose my grandparents. Um, growing up, I got to visit my grandparents on the weekend because my, grand my dad would be working as a cook in Alaska on the fishing boats. And my mom would be working, so I would always be at my grandparents' house over the weekends. Um, in my grandparents' household, there were also my aunts and uncles. So there was roughly about, they have nine kids. So in the household, there was five aunts and uncles that were living with me as well. Um, the crazy thing about the upbringing was they were only roughly about maybe six to like 10 years older than me. 
So they're still figuring out how to be adults or become young adults, but they're also raising me at the same time um, due to my grandma and grandpa working to just make a living for us to get by, right? And so growing up, I heard a lot of yelling, you know, a lot of siblings there, so they're constantly yelling. Everybody's yelling to get their point across. No one's really listening to one another. We're all just screaming and yelling to get our point across, right? And so when I was 13 years old, my grandparents were able to uh, buy our first home in Kent, Washington. So when we moved to Kent, Washington, I already automatically had no idea where I was at. There was horses and llamas and absolutely no helicopters. So it was extremely quiet. And I was like, all right, this is different. Then I go to my first day of school. It was really different. There was literally no one that looked like me. I would have to say there was a lot of white people and I'm not used to this, right? So it felt really awkward for the first couple of years. And then when I got to middle school, I made my first group of friends. A lot of these kids are in the same situation where they come from different areas of poverty um, and their parents made enough money to relocate um, to an area like Kent where they could afford their first home. Um, I felt a sense of belonging. I felt a sense of uh, these guys are familiar with my lifestyle. These guys understand the hardship of uh, you know, poverty, growing up with less, and also just we're alike. We look like one another. We dress like one another. We talk like one another. Um, and I, I finally got this sense of belonging uh, to a brotherhood. So growing up, uh, we would see a lot of like gangs and drug dealers. And these are things that I identified more so with or was drawn to because there wasn't anybody that looked like me on TV. So what I naturally gravitated towards was what I saw in front of me. So fast forward to being 14 years old, uh, 13 years old, excuse me, we used to have a newspaper out uh, in Aurora because that's where our last house was before we moved to Kent. 13 years old, Aurora, I'm with my cousin Danny, 12 years old. 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, we would deliver newspapers and uh, we have to drive up there from Kent. So it's about an hour drive. My uncle-in-law that decided to uh, dip out us that day was actually addicted to crack. So at 12 years old and 13 years old, we were left at four o'clock in the morning at who knows where, especially on Aurora, right? And I, we were laughing about it. We were like, there he goes again. This was my norm. I didn't know any better, right? I was like, all right, so I guess it's time to actually like, call someone to pick us up, I guess, you know? So someone came and picked us up. Um, within that same year was the first time I actually saw um, a bullet wound. My uncle came home from the club and he had a bullet wound. And I was, I was making fun of him for it. And we were just joking, because this is like the norm of what life was like. And um, it really, when, when they asked me to speak, and I thought about the lack of representation, it really made me think about how different my upbringing was. It made me think about the circumstances that I, I, I went through and how it shaped me into the person I am today. A lot of things that I'm sharing with you guys right now, I used to be extremely embarrassed to talk about. Because... This is not something you want to glorify. This is not something that you want to share with people if you're trying to empower people, right? And I said, how do I spin on that? So I started taking a look at my life and I started taking a look at who I am today. And I realized that there's so many hidden truths in those circumstances that are growing up. So for example, yelling, screaming, right? Why is it that I can't get my point across effectively to my friends? Because they're not listening to me when I'm yelling. As louder as you get, you're not, they're not listening to you, right? So through new relationships and new friendships, I was able to learn a new way to communicate. And now that I'm a business owner, I understand that it's all about the effectiveness in how you communicate. So although that was the way that I knew how to communicate growing up, it's not going to get me to the next level if I want to get my point across effectively. So that was the hidden truth behind understanding that there's proper ways to do things, but you just have to find them. Um, the gang life. So I mentioned to you guys that I, I was very curious in that side. I wanted to be a gangster when I was young because it was cool. I was like, this is cool. And then when I found out what you had to do, I was like, I don't want to shoot anybody. I don't, I don't want to rob anybody. Is that how I have to be down? Wait, you have to beat me up to be your friend? That doesn't make sense. Huh? I'm trying not to get beat up. So when I made my first group of friends, it made me realize that the hidden truth behind that is just, these are young, scared boys 
that are just looking for a sense of belonging. They're looking for a sense of camaraderie, brotherhood, something that they can be a part of that is bigger than themselves, right? And that is what taught me how to formulate a team, how to build a team, how to be vulnerable enough to understand what your weaknesses are and be proud enough to tell your friends like, hey dude, like this is what you're strong at. I'm not good at that. I want you to take that lead, right? Because when you can totally communicate and you could totally just let go of all your insecurities and doubts with these group of people, you're more likely to succeed. You're more likely to talk about uncomfortable conversations. You're more likely to talk about things that's gonna help you guys grow. Um, and throughout this period of time when I'm actually thinking about these things in my life, I just feel extremely blessed. Um, never imagined, never, never imagined that I would be a personality to where I would be recognized in the street um, you know, for what I do. And it's extremely humbling now that I am able to um, be a representation for something that I didn't have growing up to the younger generation. So I guess the easiest way that I could put this and just to wrap it up for you guys is that find the hidden truths in all of your circumstances. Find the hidden truths in your adversity and be free with the radical expression of self-expression of yourself. And that is how you're going to get to the fullest, um, reach the fullest potential um, that you have within yourselves. So that's, that's what I got for you guys today. Thank you.